at your convenience. I want you out in the open. I want you to marry me. Well, I can't right now. You've just got to be reasonable. Money right, now, not here's our next contestant. And a very pretty one she Money is. Can you want to tell us your name? You don't give me what, you enough. You were using me. <laughs> tell me a little about yourself. I have what? you. Circus. Oh, yes, the wonderful husband. I've been married for six years. Well, just how reasonable you think your wife's going to be when she finds out about this. Huh? What about your husband? I'll take care of my husband. Yes, I'm sure you will. I don't care that you last chance that you tell your wife you're leaving or I will. Good together. Very good. But it's over. When that child was born. That baby's better off where he is. I didn't even want the baby in the first place. What did place. you say? What did you say? Without you. You and the baby belong together. Marilyn Healy. I don't love you. You love me. I know you love me. You always come back to me, don't you? Well, I won't be back again, Marilyn. I'm warning you! I want what you promised! I'm gonna pick up that phone the minute you walk out of here! I don't think you'd do that. I'm truly sorry. Ah. Don't you see, I, I have to protect my children. And you're not giving me any choice. What are you trying to do, scare me? No. so unreasonable. I'm sorry you can't understand me. Because I've been honest with you. Very honest. And reasonable. I must, I must think of my kids. And I only hope you'll be able to see that this is, this is a moral thing because there's so much at stake. Congratulations, Betty. You've just won $880. Well, what have you got to say for yourself? Oh, I don't believe it. I don't believe it. Show's over. going out of style ever since. Is that right? So what else is new? Well, so far he's not taking the place apart. What's the matter with you? Your insurance rates go up? Huh?
Might do you a little good to unload some, too. I got clean ears and broad shoulders. How about it? Now, don't try to thank me, John. You don't have to thank your friends. Come on. Gavin, send an ambulance over here to John Healy's place, will you? You'd better send the coroner, too. No, I... No? No, it's his wife. You read the newspapers, don't you? Of course, I read the newspapers. Well, then you read of Mrs. Healy's murder and her husband's arrest. I did. And you formed no definite opinion regarding his innocence or guilt? I did not. Um... Uh, how would you describe your family's financial status? As you were growing up, I mean. Comfortable. Better than average. <clears throat> and how would you describe yourself politically? Conservative, liberal? More liberal. Naturally sympathetic to those less fortunate than yourself. Well, I'm not a bleeding heart, Mr. Lavelle. I'll vote as the evidence dictates, regardless. Acceptable to the prosecution. Thank you, Ms. Davies. Mrs. Davies, have you ever met the defendant? No. Have you ever met the uh, wife of the defendant, Marilyn? No, never. Thank you. Acceptable to the defense. trying to call you for days. Huh. Are you a little nervous? Just a little bit? I'm looking forward to serving. And it's the first time I've ever felt like a citizen before in my life. I know. I was going to try to get out of it. But Fred made so many cracks about oh. pity the poor defendant <laughs> with me on the jury that I got mad. So here I am. <laughs> well, I'm going to have to get a lawyer when I get home. Why? Oh, we were all set to fly to the Caribbean. Our first vacation in years without the kids. So... Say goodbye to one happy husband. Are you kidding? This is your big chance. Let him go, then you take a separate vacation later. You are a bad person. Write the mileage. Five, three, eight. Now. Mom. Hi. Can I eat dinner over at Danny's? Danny's? Did Danny invite you or did his mother? Danny. Well, till his mother invites you, I'm having dinner at my house in one hour, and you're invited. Do you accept? Um. If I have stuffed potatoes with cheese. Okay. Okay. How's the arm? Uh, Dad says I'll be pitching in a week. A week? Doctor said a month. Get your bike out of the driveway. Prudence Day, 
Ivy, you come here at once. agreed I should. What do you mean? I couldn't declare myself prejudiced. Why not, for Pete's sake? Well, you'd have to be on the stand to understand. I mean, there are questions. And it's your duty to be honest. What about your duty to yourself, Susan, and your family? You need this vacation. I know. Never more than now. But I couldn't perjure myself. Could I? A man's life is at stake. Susan, are you telling me you're on the jury for the Healy murder case? Yes. Huh? Yes! Oh, Susan, but we've got tickets, we've got reservations, everything is set for tomorrow. It can't be a long trial. We'll go as soon as it's over, okay? I'll make it up to you. I can't tell you what it feels like to be on the stand. The responsibility, the, the involvement. I think it's the first time I really felt like a full-fledged citizen of this community. Angel, I thought this was all settled. I mean, why you have this sudden attack of civic mindedness the day before our vacation is a little beyond me. It's tough to understand. I, I feel bad about not going, but if I didn't do this, I would, I would feel terrible. were the usual thing then at the Healy house, is that right? Yes, sir. Violent ones. Objection, Your Honor. Now, the witness cannot possibly know if the arguments were physical or not. Sustained. Mr. LaBelle. Well, by violent, Mrs. Boylan, can we assume that you mean they were loud and very clearly heard? You certainly may. Good. <laughs> now, on the night of uh, February 8th, you overheard another argument, didn't you? I didn't overhear anything. I couldn't help hearing. Yes. Well, at what time was this, Mrs. Boylan? Well, it had to be 9 o'clock, because I was watching my game show that night, and it didn't start until 8.30. Well, could you hear any words precisely then, Mrs. Boylan? I certainly didn't want to. I even turned up my set so I wouldn't have to. Still, I could hear Mrs. Healy. Oh, not what she was saying, mind you, but uh, how she sounded. Angry at first, and then scared. Real scared. Well, the argument continued until what time then, to the best of your recollection? About 10 o'clock. Thank you. You're with us. <coughs> Mrs. Boylan, now you, uh, you testified that you turned up the volume on your TV in order to drown out the argument next door. I did. And yet, you were able to hear Mrs. Healy's voice. And uh, it sounded to you angry, then scared, real scared. That's what you said, isn't it? That's what I heard, and that's what I said. And how would you characterize the sound of Mr. Healy's voice? Oh, well, him... Well, I guess I... I, I mean... Well, I couldn't tell. Uh, would you speak up just a little bit, Mrs. Boylan? Uh, the jury can't quite hear you. I said I couldn't tell how he sounded. His voice I couldn't hear. Then Mrs. Healy could have been arguing with someone other than her husband, couldn't she? Oh, not likely. Who could it be? That's what we're trying to find out, Mrs. Boylan. What time did you go to bed that night? Ten o'clock, right after my movie. And the argument had ended? I've already told you so. 
Wouldn't you say it was possible, Mrs. Borland, that uh, Mrs. Healy might have had a later visitor that night? Since you were asleep, you wouldn't have heard the car. Anything is possible, young man. But what I would say is that if the argument stopped when I went to bed, it was because John Healy had murdered his wife. Your Honor, I object. Off into the night I object, Your possible, Honor. As usual. I ask that the witness's last remark be stricken from the record. Sustained, Mr. Tanner. An unfounded remark like that does irreparable damage to my client's cause in the eyes of the jury, Mrs. Boylan. The recorder will delete the last remarks of the witness. And the jury is advised to disregard them. Good luck. No further questions. Dr. Hayden, I'm going to try to keep this cross-examination as short as possible. There's no doubt in your mind that this scarf was the instrument of death. The marks on her throat indicate that quite clearly. Find the owner, find the murderer. In my opinion, yes. Well, unfortunately, there are at least 50 scarves exactly like that you could buy in town right now. You're very sure about the scarf. You equally sure about the time of death? As I said, 10 o'clock. No margin for error. At most, an hour. Oh. Mrs. Healy could have died then as early as 9 o'clock, or as late as 11. She could have. She didn't. if you keep a record of it. Well, if the gas company kept better track of what they had the way I do, we wouldn't be where we are today. True. Anyway, you promised when you married me to accept my little peculiarity. Right, I did. Now, I want you to take your little peculiarities up those stairs and put on something sexy because we are going out tonight. I mean, the kids haven't even been fed. Where would I get any... She'll be here in 27 minutes. I gave you two Christmases ago? I don't know why. No reason. She was the kindest person. She had a heart of spun gold. She absolutely didn't know how to say no. Are you implying then that John... Uh, strike that. You mean that your daughter welcomed uh, John Healy's attentions? She pitied him. And I think she was fond of him in her own way. She was never going to marry him. Why not, Mrs. Goddard? I don't want to be the one to cast the first stone. Please go on, Mrs. Goddard. Does it uh, sound terrible if... I say that Marilyn was half afraid of John Healy. How exactly do you mean? When he drank, he was violent. Oh. When Marilyn was pregnant, uh, he got drunk and made her fall downstairs. You mean he pushed her? 
Marilyn said it was an accident. I don't know exactly... Objection! Well, why, uh, why did your daughter marry John Healy, Mrs. Cotter? I don't know, really. Didn't she offer you any explanations? Yes. She said that she was tired and that John would be kind to her. And did your daughter find the relief that she sought? Oh, poor child. Could you make that a little clearer, please, Mrs. Cotter? Did you know that being pregnant is particularly a peaceful time? When Marilyn found out that she was going to have a baby, she, uh, she just kind of withered away. I don't know. She closed herself off and cried. She cried. And when the child was born, born dead, she thought that it was a judgment. And I thought that it was because she was pushed, fell downstairs. Your witness. Now, Mrs. Cotter, I don't want to make this any more painful than I have to. I'll, uh, I'll try to be brief. Was your daughter living at home before she decided to marry? No, I don't see there's anything wrong with a grown person spending time away from home. I didn't mean to imply there was. Do you know where she was at that time? No, she said that she had to get away by herself for a while and think things over. Do you remember the day that she told you she was getting married? It was the middle of August. I remember that she was very upset. Upset? Tired, perhaps. And then, unexpectedly, she told you of her plans to marry John Healy. Why unexpectedly? I mean, a woman can change her mind. Her explanation was that uh, at least John Healy would take care of her. Oh, I told that to the gentleman. But... Well, that seems to indicate that Marilyn didn't actually think of John Healy as dangerous or violent, doesn't it? Objection. Sustained. <clears throat> Mrs. Cotter, you told this court that your daughter seemed unhappy about her pregnancy. She never had a moment's peace. I presume she didn't want the child so early in the marriage. Did you ever ask her why, if she felt this way, she hadn't taken precautions against pregnancy? I may have. What was her answer? She began to cry. But she gave no explanation? No, she didn't. You were very close to your daughter, weren't you? Yes. She told you everything, didn't she? Oh, yes. But not about her pregnancy. Why, Mrs. Cotter? I don't know. I don't know! Mrs. Cotter, isn't it true that your daughter Marilyn was already pregnant when she married John Healy? Objection! Mm -hmm. Objection! My poor... Oh! You don't seem to be too aware of me these days. I'm sorry, Don. <laughs> this case is getting to me. I can't seem to think about anything else anymore. How much longer do you think? You know, we're not supposed to discuss this case outside the courtroom. Well, push a little, Angel. Because guilty or not guilty, I miss you. I'll try. See you tonight. And all during Mrs. Healy's convalescence, after the unfortunate stillbirth, her husband never once visited her? She didn't want to see him. But he came to the hospital. Yes, yes, he came every day. But Mrs. Healy refused to see him. She seemed almost afraid of him. Objection, Your Honor. That's pure speculation. Sustained. Mr. Lubell, will you please rephrase your questions? I have no further questions, Your Honor. Dr. Braun, how premature was Mrs. Healy's child? Do you mean how many months? Was it a fetus or an embryo? Had it developed enough so that you could determine its age? I can't answer that question. You mean you will not? 
That's right. The relationship between a doctor and Is a the patient. information contained in your report on the case? As a rule, it would be. Your Honor, defense requests that Dr. Braun's report on the delivery be admitted as evidence. I object, Your Honor. This is extraneous. Mr. Unnecessary. Lubell, your objection is unnecessary. The bench will decide whether Dr. Braun's report is admissible as evidence or not. Yes, sir. Uh, Mr. Tanner, why do you wish to insert this report as evidence? Your Honor, the prosecution has tried to present the relationship between the defendant and the victim in this case as unhappy, but they failed to present a, a convincing cause for any such friction. The defense proposes to establish such a cause, even if by doing so, we also establish a motive. Now, as of December, the Healy's had been married for only four months. It's extremely important that we know the approximate age of Mrs. Healy's stillborn child. Well, I fail to see why the insertion of any such evidence as this would affect the circumstances of her death. I'm trying to establish a motive for Mrs. Healy's murder, a motive that could apply to someone other than John Healy. Well, the defense will have to find some other way to do it. Petition denied. Then I have no further questions. Uh, we have no questions to ask, Your Honor. If it please the court, the people rest. All right, in that event, I suggest that this court adjourn for lunch. We'll return promptly at 1.30. What a waste of the taxpayer's money. The defense hasn't presented his case yet. The defense hasn't got a prayer. No. That man is just as guilty as he can be. In your opinion. What are you doing here? I'm taking you to lunch. You want the chocolate shake or the vanilla? I don't know if I can eat. What's the matter? Mr. Bracken, the jury foreman, it has me so upset. Why? He's got Keeley guilty, even before the defense has, has made its case. That's wrong. What about our responsibility to the innocent until proven guilty? Angel, we do have that responsibility, but it's not all yours. It is for me. Bracken's only one man. There are 11 other people on that jury. But he, he's a foreman. He'll sway everybody to his way of thinking. You'll sway him right back, if you still believe this man is innocent in the end. I haven't even made up my mind yet. Okay, then I'll make it up for you. What? I'll take the chocolate shake. <laughs> Tuna sandwich for you. Our defense rests on only one cornerstone. That what is called the shadow of a doubt does indeed exist in this case. That there was someone else in Mrs. Healy's life besides her husband. And that that someone had not only the opportunity to kill Mrs. Healy, but also had the motive. The defense calls Mr. Willis Wright. Willis Wright to the stand. Raise your right hand. Do you swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, so help you God? I do. Please be seated. Mr. Wright, what is your profession? I'm a lawyer. Where do you practice? Cedar Falls, about 45 minutes from here. Would you look at that photograph, Mr. Wright, and tell us if you recognize the woman in it? I do. Marilyn Healy. Only that's not the name she used when she visited me. When Mrs. Healy came to see you, she was still single. She had not yet married John Healy, had she? That's correct. What did Mrs. Healy expect of you? She seemed to think that she could sue a man who had made her pregnant. Did she mention the person she had in mind? Oh, no, she didn't. She was very discreet. Did she give you any information that would help us to identify this man in question? 
Not unless there's only one man in this whole town who claims to be unhappily married. <laughs> well, then, she did tell you that the man who'd gotten her pregnant was married. That's why she came to me. What else did you talk about? Well, she had the idea that the law could force the man to live up to his word, which was to divorce his wife and marry her. What was your advice? Well, I told her that under the law, there was no such remedy. But uh, after the child was born, if she wanted, she could then take him into court over paternity and hope to gain child support. Until then, there was nothing I or the law could do to help her. Did you see her again? No, I'm sorry I didn't. Thank you, Mr. Wright. Uh, your witness. As a lawyer, Mr. Wright, would you say that the uh, thrust of the defense in this case is to present us with a picture of uh, John Healy as a bewitched, unsuspecting man who took pity on Marilyn Healy and uh, married her to give her child a name? Objection. Counsel is arranging the evidence to suit a theory of his own. Sustained. Counsel will confine himself to the known facts, not what he surmises the defense's line of reasoning to be. Thank you, Your Honor. Yes, sir. Now, uh, Mrs. Healy uh, visited you uh, when? In August, first part of August. In August. But Miss Cotter didn't become Mrs. Healy until September. So a stillborn child arrives in December to Marilyn and John Healy, and a few weeks later, in a fit of drunken jealousy, he mindlessly kills his wife for being on objection. Now, I protest, Your Honor. Counsel is presenting his summation. He's not examining a witness. Sustained. Mr. Lubell. You are standing right on the edge of contempt citation. Now, if you have questions to ask this witness, ask them. I beg the court's pardon. I have no further questions. I can't give you any good reasons. I just can't believe he did it. You're the only person in the town who thinks that. Even Elaine says the prosecution has done everything to tell Healy how long he's going to be in prison. You know, Don, what happened to Marilyn Healy isn't so unusual. She met a summer bachelor and got involved. Only mistake she made was believing what he told her. Dad, I'm getting pregnant. That man could be someone we know, someone right here in town. We have friends who feel trapped in their marriages. It happens all around us. It's so simple. So sad. Angel, one of the things I love most about you is your compassion. Yes, sir. Did you hear uh, house just last fall? On the evening of February the 8th, Mr. Gorman, what were you doing? Well, I had a date with this girl that I know, and we went for a drive. To Mooney's Glen? Well, yes, sir. It's uh, pretty secluded out there, and so we drove out and parked and, well, you know, just fooled around. <laughs> uh, where exactly did you park, Mr. Gorman? Uh, in this vacant lot across from the Healy's house. And about what time were you there? I mean, for how long? I, I guess we got there about 8.30 or so and stayed probably 20 minutes, just till we heard Marilyn Healy. Oh, do you mean arguing? Well, no, sir. Uh, she came out and uh, called to somebody. I, she must have heard my car motor running and thought we'd just driven up. And what did she say? Well, she, uh... <laughs> we heard the door open and she, we were sort of surprised, you know, because she was standing there on the porch and she calls out, Is that you, honey? It seemed to you that she was expecting a visitor. Well, somebody. I mean, uh, it was cold that night. You're not going to stand around outside talking to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I guess not. Uh, then what happened? Well, then, well, me and this girl, we decided to get out of there. I mean, it was private property and all. Well, you know. <laughs> there are lots of other places. To... <laughs> uh, did you see anyone else as you left? Well, not see exactly. We, we almost got sideswiped, though, by a car that wheeled into the Glen as we were heading out. Could you see the driver of that car, or could you see what kind of a car it was? Well, sir, to be fair, though I, well, no, I'm pretty sure what kind of car it was. That doesn't seem to be good enough, does it? I, I could see that it was a man driving. 
Your fairness is very commendable, Mr. Gorman. Thank you. Your witness. Mr. Mr. Gorman. <clears throat> <laughs> Mr. Gorman, you'll excuse me if I sound a little harsh, but you're fairly unclear about a great many details, aren't you? I don't know what you mean. Well, you are clear that you were in Mooney's Glen on February 8th between 8.30 and 20 minutes later? Yes, sir. Mr. Gorman, I noticed that you don't wear a watch. How could you be clear about what the time was? My girlfriend has a watch. Oh, is he your girlfriend? I suppose that you and she stopped uh, whatever you were doing frequently to check the time. <laughs> Let's try to summarize this, Mr. Gorman, shall we? Now, you say that you heard Mrs. Healy call out as though she were expecting someone. Perhaps it was her husband, perhaps not. Then you and your girlfriend hightailed it out of the Glen, and on the way out, you say uh, you were almost hit by another car, but you can't identify the car. You neither know what kind of car it was, it could have been John Healy's, nor who, in fact, was driving it. And you're unclear, after all, about... Uh, about what time all of this happened. Now, without seeming uh, too severe, Mr. Gorman, I would call your testimony here this afternoon total speculation, not worth the time and attention of this court or this jury. Well, you can uh, call it whatever you want. I mean, I was just trying to be fair. But if you really want to know, it was about it. I did see a watch. And I'm sure that it was in Jack Healy's car because, first of all, Healy's got a pickup. And second of all, the car that I saw, unless I'm blind or something, was a cream-colored station wagon. Now, that's all that I know and everything i got to say. Seven miles home, 14 miles.
Angel? Where are you? In the kitchen, rustling. Working this late? Uh, oh, I was just ah, went for a drive. Clear my head. Where are the kids? At your mother's. Well, that's good. I couldn't face them tonight. <laughs> what are you doing? I am cooking up a little uh, surprise. How's mother? She's terrific. She's got two whole weeks now to undo all the good things you've been doing with the kids. Don, would you hate me if I went to bed? I'd just love to taste your culinary masterpiece, but I don't think I'd really do it justice. Angel, that isn't like you. Are you upset about something? What's the matter? Did you ever meet Marilyn Healy? Meet Marilyn Healy? I might have. Uh, it's a small town. If I didn't meet her, I remember hearing a lot about her. She used to be a pretty wild lady before she got married. Why? Well, so many things are said each day. There are witnesses I've never even mentioned. Today, for example, we were told that Marilyn Healy had a, a late visitor the night she was killed. A man driving a cream-colored station wagon. Okay. <sighs> this is so silly. When I came home and you and the kids were gone, I drove out to Mooney's Glen by myself. And? Here in my mileage record, for the day Marilyn Healy was killed, there are 14 extra miles on our station wagon. I even put a question mark right by the entry. Guess I didn't ask you about it. <sighs> I see. Well, Angel, before you convict me without a trial, there are a few flaws in that logic I think you ought to consider. A, there are at least two dozen cars in this town that could be called cream colored. B, you have been known to have little lapses when you forget to write things in that book. For instance, the other night, when we went out to dinner, I think if you check in that book, you'll find that you neglected to note the mileage. And C, whatever the mileage is, it could be matched with a hundred other places in this town. For instance, your mother's, my factory. True or false? All true. And D, the most important thing. I happen to be a very happily married man. Angel, you and the kids are my, my life. No, it's just so silly. I just can't seem to forget about it. I think I understand. You want a drink? Come on, I'll fix one. What about your dinner? Oh, it doesn't matter. Maybe after a drink, both of us will feel like it.
was a it was a shock to me because I personally had hoped that maybe with the baby coming we might become closer together. In fact, I had even uh, I went to my boss and I asked him maybe for shorter hauls so that uh, so that we could be and I could be there when the baby came. But uh, that's when I. Uh, that's when I found out. What did you find out? I found out why uh, Marilyn married me. Why was that, John? Well, I used... Marilyn felt like that. Uh, she felt she had been made a fool of. And she turned around and she made a fool out of me. Did she say that? Yes, sir. Yes, she did. It was just after she came back from the hospital. We were having dinner, and uh, I asked her if she wanted some more wine. She just, uh, she just started laughing at me. Did she explain that? Yes, sir, did she. She said that if I, I was trying to get her drunk so that I could make love with her, that I better just forget the whole idea because... Uh, she wasn't going to make love with me ever again. I asked her, I said, I asked her why. She said, why do you think I married you? She said, listen, that she had a baby coming. And that by the time the father had said he was through with her, it was too late for an abortion. And uh, that the baby needed a name. And that uh, Healy was as good as any name. But uh, she didn't need that now because dead babies don't need names. What did you say, John? I didn't say anything. I, uh, I just can't remember. It happened too fast. Did you think about a divorce then? No, sir, I didn't. I, uh, I didn't think of divorce. I loved Marilyn. I loved her very, very much. Tell us what happened on the night of February 8th, John. Remember as much as you can. The 8th. Well, I, I just, uh, I just gotten home. And, uh, the, there was something about the house that was different. It was rather nice. Uh, and, uh, I thought that maybe Marilyn had changed her mind. And so I, I wanted to show her that I was happy. Uh, so I, uh, I just leaned over to kiss her. And, well, she just uh, shoved me out of the way. She said that she was sick of the house. And she was sick of me. And that uh, she wanted to be free. Then what happened? Nothing really happened. I, mean, I couldn't, uh, I just couldn't take any more, so I left the house. I, well, I wasn't feeling too good. I was pretty unhappy, and and Marilyn was uh, was there, and I was crying a little bit, and shaking. So I just left. When you left the house, was your wife still alive? Yes, sir. When I left the house, Marilyn was still alive. And this is honestly the truth. It is the truth. Did you ever ask yourself, John, who the man was? This other man in your wife's life, the father of the child that she lost at Christmas time. But, uh, no, well, the man was n not around. He, and I couldn't do anything about the baby. And you never asked your wife who the man was? No, sir. And apart from that one time, she never mentioned it either? No, she didn't. Not even comparing you with him, for instance? Well, maybe, uh, maybe this one time. But it, see, it was just before Marilyn had the baby, and she was very sick. And, uh, I had called the ambulance, and I was there with Marilyn, I was holding her hand, and she was very white. And she said, uh, she said, honey, she said, honey, just don't leave me, please. All right. 
It was strange because I, I didn't know whether she was talking to me or not because her voice, it was uh, a different quality in her voice. I had never heard it. And she just repeated over, she said, remember, honey, when you used to call me Angel? I, uh, I said I did, but I, I, hadn't, I never called Marilyn Angel. I, I never had. So, uh, but she just kept saying that over and over and over. She said, she said, honey, I, I hope you'll call me Angel again. Ladies and gentlemen, John Healy was neither heartless nor brutal. He loved his wife until her death, even though he received almost nothing in return. Enraged, frantic with a desire to strike back, John Healy willfully punished his wife with his own hands. Guilty of murder in the first degree. If, on the other hand, you decide a reasonable doubt remains that a... Crime has not been committed by my client. Only a mistake of believing, of hoping in the goodness of his heart. And you will be secluded until such time as you have reached a satisfactory verdict based on the evidence before you. Remember when you called me Angel. Remember that? Remember when you called me Angel. Well, Angel, before you convict me without a trial, I think there are a few flaws in your logic. Whatever happened to that yellow scarf I gave you two Christmases ago? I don't know. Most important thing of all, I happen to be a happily married man. Angel. Even the kids of my life. There must be at least two dozen cars in this town that could be called cream colored. I know, it sounds so silly. Then we still have three holdouts. Uh, Miss Sinclair, perhaps you'll give us your reasons for voting for acquittal? First, I don't think that poor man's guilt has been clearly established. Second, I, for one, won't be satisfied until the man who made Marilyn Healy pregnant has been apprehended. Well, now, Miss Sinclair, it's almost 7 o'clock. Now, if we spend time on the misdeeds of last summer, which we aren't here to judge, it'll take us days to reach a verdict. You wanted my thinking. You have it. Mr. Bowman, you voted for acquittal again. I did. I think the only honest witness in the whole trial was John Healy. Well, you realize he was probably coached by his lawyer. Please, can't we stop this? We're not supposed to be here to fight. Miss Sinclair is right. Why don't we call it a day? Have dinner and a good night's sleep. Surely, Mr. Bracken, you'll have to agree that coming fresh to a problem in the morning sometimes helps. All right, how many want to adjourn? Here. All right, all right, let's adjourn. Court pays for the dinner, too, you know. Now, Mr. Bowman, if you'll step outside and tell the bailiff. <laughs> About 12.30. Oh, that late? Oh, my. Oh, well, thank you. Good night. Good night.
Angel. Oh. Oh, I thought I heard somebody coming up the stairs. You really scared me. What are you doing home? Something wrong? I need, I need your help, Don. Your advice. Sure, baby. Get out of this stuff. Look, you're soaked. You're freezing. Here, let me take this thing off. What happened? Trial over? It's not over? Uh, well, how... Wait a minute. Aren't you supposed to be locked up in that hotel room with the other jurors? Running out's a pretty serious thing, Susan. I know, I know. I'm so confused, Don. About what, honey? About the trial? Three of us are holding out for an innocent verdict. Uh huh. And? Should I give in? What, what, what can I tell you? You're the only person who can tell me. Now I'm confused, Angel. <coughs> Don. Will you swear you never met Marilyn Healy? What? Last summer, when you couldn't join us at the lake. Where were you? Working. Right here. Working like a, a madman. Did you have an affair with her last summer? Joy, being with her, making love to her. Did you? Were you in love with her? Did you know she had a dead babe? destroy everything that you and I have built up so carefully. You don't know how hard I tried to argue myself out of what I thought. Well, it's over now. Why did you do it? She threatened to tell everybody in this town about... I couldn't let that happen. I couldn't let you go through that. But that it's not important. Angel, what is important is that you and I stick together and that we keep loving each other. And the kids, the kids are very important in this. I want you to think a minute. You think what it would mean if they knew what happened. Think what, what it could do to them. You want me to vote for conviction? Well, isn't that the simplest thing to do? I suppose. 
I mean, you told me that Healy doesn't care what happens. He's resigned himself. He's stopped fighting. It isn't as though he's going to be executed. We don't even have capital punishment anymore. I mean, he'll get a few years at most, and with time off for good behavior, he'll be out in no time. Angel. Angel. This thing is going to make us stronger, you'll see. I'm going to be loving, I'm going to be considerate, I'm going to be more patient. All the things I always thought you were. I am those things. I haven't changed. You, you don't think anything like that could ever happen again, do you? No, honey. Trust me. Final decision's up to you. Our lives, all of our lives, are in your hands. Kids, too. I believe in you. I know you're going to do the right thing. Now, listen, get into some dry clothes, because I'm going to get the car and bring it around the front. I've got to get you back before they miss you. thing, really. You know, I was... I was home in bed reading. And, uh... Oh, the children were at their grandma's. My wife, my, my Susan, was, uh, locked up downtown with the Healy jury in a hotel room and, uh... I heard somebody coming up the stairs. I thought it was a burglar. Before I knew it, I was struggling with him, and uh, I guess I had more strength than I thought. I mean, I didn't even know it was a... Thank <laughs> you. 